Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. And this being uh, the prophet Sunday in Advent, this being the Sunday of hope, uh, we hear prophetic words from Jesus himself this morning. So Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. In it, we read these words. But in those days, following that distress, and, and I need to pause there because anytime you see a, a segue like that, you need to ask yourself, uh, in those days, following what distress? You need to see the transition and ask yourself what went on before that. And, and Jesus has been speaking with his disciples, his followers, and so on, <clears throat> and the disciples, John and Andrew and James, ask when, um, when some of Jesus' prophetic words will be fulfilled. You can see that in verse 3. Um, and before that, Jesus has said to them, do you see all these great buildings referring to the temple and all the stuff around it? And he says, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And so um, James and John and so on, they ask, well, when's that going to happen? And Jesus says, well, watch out. And he goes on to explain that, that in that time there will be people who, who will try and deceive um, Christians or followers of Christ, claiming that they are Jesus come again. Uh, he, he says that there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nations and so on. Um, and, and, and on until we read we read about the destruction of the temple. We read about the abomination that causes desolation in verse 14. And then we read these words after that. Um, but in those days, following that distress, that upheaval, that distress that was just talked about, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, learn this lesson, Jesus continues, from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about the day or the hour, no one knows, even, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now, uh, you need to be aware, fully aware, that there is, are many, many, many interpretations of these words of Jesus. Many, many uh, theologians and thinkers have processed through these words over the years and come up with different conclusions. Okay? You need to be aware of that. 
And, and as a pastor, as a theologian, I do not claim to have an absolute corner on the true interpretation of these words. Except insofar as Jesus makes one thing very clear. And what is the most clear thing in this whole passage? What is the thing that Jesus emphasizes so much? Keep watch. Keep watch right? That is the key thing. Right? Uh, exactly how all of this is going to play out, prophetically speaking, in a sense, it's not the point. The point that Jesus is making is for his disciples and for us to keep watch, to be aware, to not be caught sleeping. And what does that mean, of course? That means that we retain the hope that we have that Jesus will come again that we watch intelligently and awarely and prayerfully and spirit-fed, spirit-ledly, leadedly, whatever, right? We, we, we watch and we wait, but we also do things, right? We don't just sit there and watch like people watching a football game. Any, any supposed Christian who sits there and rubs his or her hands with glee at how the signs of the times show that the world is ending soon, but does nothing to share the gospel with anyone, just watches it all, there's something severely wrong there. We're not just armchair quarterbacks or, or couch potatoes in the kingdom of God. So, the big point is watch. Be aware. And the second big point, just like the servants who have been left at home, you need to do stuff. Right? The servants who stay at home in this passage, they are going on the business about, of their master, including the one who is called to watch, to be aware. So that when the master comes home, nobody is caught napping. And this is, a, this is a theme that Jesus talks about over and over again. The parable of the, the maids who were supposed to have the oil in their lamps for the wedding that was coming and they don't have it and they're caught unawares and they, they miss the wedding. Or, or the, the parable of, you know, so many, so many other illustrations, right? Where people are caught napping. Jesus tells the parable of, of the wedding feast where he goes out to, you know, say, well, how come you're not at my wedding feast? Oh, I've got to go do this. I've got to go do that. I've got to go do the other thing. And, and Jesus says, well, wait a second. This is the most important thing. And so he goes out to the highways and byways and brings people in. Time and time again, God warns us through Jesus Christ to be aware and to be going about the business of the kingdom of God at all times. Now, having said that, it is important to dig into this a little bit. Because there are some, in terms of the specific interpretation, because there are some things that are troublesome in here. Like, what do we do about this? Right? Because Jesus says, you know, but in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then he talks about how this generation will not pass away before these things come to pass. Verse 30, I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Now, I'm pretty sure that none of us were alive when Jesus was talking. And so, if you're looking at this and you're saying, well, wait a second, obviously Jesus is wrong. 
And how can that be? Because then we're in trouble. If Jesus is the Son of God and he knows these things, then he can't be wrong on this. So what does Jesus mean when he says, surely this generation will not pass away before these things come to pass? Well, that's one of the areas of interpretation where you run into troubles. Some theologians have said that, well, the reality is, is that these things did come to pass in the lifetime of his hearers. And you might be sitting here, well, wait a second, right? Uh, the stars haven't fallen from the sky. The sun didn't turn dark. Well, like, what's going on here? The reality is, is that around A.D. 70, so the year 70, which would be approximately 40-ish years after Jesus said these words, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, uh, the people of Israel, they rebelled against Rome. They had a couple of struggles in there. And then uh, Rome said, that's it. We've had enough. And they sent in their troops and they destroyed Jerusalem. And they threw down the temple. And indeed, they had a, an abomination that causes desolation, as it were, in the form of... Uh, bringing in the god Zeus or a statue of the emperor, I forget which, uh, into the temple where people were supposed to worship it and then destroying the temple utterly and so on. And so there have been theologians and, and historians who have said, okay, that's what Jesus was talking about. It happened. When Jesus says, not one brick will be left upon another, not one stone will be left upon another, um, that happened. In AD 70, it's done. It's finished. Right? And, and indeed, you know, they talk about how there was an eclipse around this time and so on and so forth. Right? Um, that is one interpretation. Another interpretation is that these things will happen still in the future. When you talk about the tribulation and the Antichrist and, and the, the, the abomination that causes desolation that is perpetrated by the Antichrist at some future date. And then when you look at it that way, then the word generation is not referring to a human generation like my generation to Lydia's generation or whatever, but it is rather speaking about the generation or the age or the, the complete unit of God-viewed time, right? In which case, it could be any amount of time. It is whatever time God says it is. Which makes sense when you look at the passage because Jesus says on the one hand, this generation will not pass away before these things happen. But then on the other hand, he says that no one will know. No one will know when these things happen. Verse 32, right like immediately after. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son. That's himself. But only the Father. Right? So Jesus is maybe talking about something that will happen in the fullness of time. Is another similar passage. In the fullness of time. We have talked about before how prophecy, biblical prophecy, often has multiple fulfillments. How often the prophet views from a certain angle and can see something in the distance, but n not necessarily see the whole thing. Right? So when Isaiah prophesies, Behold, the virgin shall give birth and bear a son, there are at least two fulfillments of that. Because virgin can also mean just young lady. There is an, a, a fulfillment of that that is directly related to Israel coming back from exile and coming back to the nation of Israel, to the land. And there is a further fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment, which is Jesus being born of Mary. 
There's not one fulfillment of that passage. There is a fulfillment, and then there's the fulfillment. Right? In a like manner, this may be exactly how this passage is to be looked at. There is a fulfillment with the sack of Jerusalem in AD 70, and there's the fulfillment which will occur in the days just before Jesus returns. This is, as far as I can tell, the most likely scenario is that there is at least, there are at least two fulfillments, a smaller one and the bigger one. Okay, so now we go back to the point. The point is to watch, to be aware. Because certainly we can see some of these things occurring and they are constantly occurring. There has not been a generation like a human generation that has gone by since these words that are spoken that didn't wonder whether or not Jesus was coming again very soon. Regardless, we need to be on the watch. And we need to be doing our Master's business. And lastly, we need to be wary. We need to be wary of people who claim to be Christ's. Who claim to be Savior. And I, I'm going to say this, and some people may not like it, but it is important. Someone like Donald Trump, he says things, whether he means them or not, he says things that imply that he is a savior. He says things like, I've done more for black people than any other president since maybe, maybe Abraham Lincoln. Or I've done more for Christians. Or I've done more for this or that. Uh, he is claiming, at least with his words, he is claiming things that do not belong to him. Even if he does good things, it is dangerous to give that kind of talk too much credence. Politicians, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Justin Trudeau or Aaron O'Toole, they are not saviors. Not a one of them. Pastors are not saviors either. If you come across a pastor who claims to be a savior in some way, there's a problem. The pastor is not a savior. And you know what? Money's not a savior, and power is not a savior. And job security is not a savior. And insurance is not a savior. And goodness sakes, McDonald's is not a savior. There is only one savior. And yet this world is full of people and things and organizations and spirits that are claiming to be able to save you. And they're all deceits. They are all lies. One of the worst things about the election in the United States this past year, from my perspective, was how both sides of the political spectrum were claiming that if 
the other person got elected, it would essentially be the apocalypse. If Joe Biden gets elected, that's the end of the United States as we know it, and, and we might as well become communists. Whatever. If John, Donald Trump gets elected, the, the, the world will regard us as the worst country on the planet, and we might as well throw our lives away, and it'll be the end of the United States as we know it. <sighs> Whatever. It's baloney. I mean, even if, even if the United States or Canada were to fall apart because of some megalomaniac in power, whether on the left or the right or whatever, even if that were to happen, it, it's irrelevant to who our Savior is. If zombies rise up out of the earth and start to conquer the universe, it doesn't matter. Because Jesus is the Savior. And not even the zombie apocalypse can stop him. I'm just saying. Right? And so this is the hope of this Sunday. The prophecy Sunday. The prophet Sunday. The hope of this Sunday is that Jesus is the Savior. We need to watch for His coming again. We need to be about the business of our King, of our Master while we are here. And we need to be wary of anyone who is claiming to be a Savior other than Jesus. This is our Sunday. And we need to proclaim that hope clearly in this world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do not know when you will send Jesus here to earth again. We do know that he will come again and that he will judge the living and the dead and that all things will be made finally and totally and completely right. And we know that in the meantime, you have sent your spirit who lives and works in our very beings right now. And we know that you are right now the proper and true and only King of this world. Father, we confess that we often are tempted to put our hope in some false Christ, some false prophet who claims that this, that, or the other thing will save us from everything that's terrible. But God, we confess right here and now that only Your Son Jesus is our Savior, our Christ, our Lord. And no one else is King of our lives. Help us, O oh God, to keep our watch. Help us, O oh God, to be about the business of Your kingdom. And help us us, O oh God, to be wary of those who claim to be Christ's but are not. God, not only that, help us to communicate those truths to our neighbors and friends and even to our fellow believers that we may not be led astray. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.